Okay. So here we are. I think this is how it, what it's uh, meant to be going live. Super thrilled to have you all with us. It's uh, the topic is moving to a cashless society and that this must accelerate digital inclusion. I'm super happy to have amazing speakers today with us. Um, I think we are going to start by introducing ourselves. Um, we have here Paul Sanar, um, Chief Executive Officer of Rio Advancement Incorporation. Um, we have Nalima Paraska, President and Chief Executive Officer of Snapit Solutions USA. Um, and additionally, Ben Crawford, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Central Nick from United Kingdom. I'm Happy to have you all with us. Uh, we are just missing this time, unfortunately, one speaker. Um, but um, I'm looking forward to this uh, fruitful discussion. Please introduce yourself. Ben, maybe we start with you. Happy to start. Hi, uh, hi everyone. My name's uh, Ben Crawford. As mentioned, I'm the chief executive of uh, Central Mac. We're a um, technology company listed on the London Stock Exchange. And uh, we provide uh, uh, tools to to everyone from small the smallest businesses through to enterprise customers and governments with some of the tools required to uh, to digitize businesses and move online, such as domain names, online marketing, uh, hosting, uh, monetization of websites. Um, we have customers in virtually every country in the world, and we work with. Um, some of the largest companies in the world uh, very closely, as well as with governments of some of the smallest countries in the world. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, Nalima, do you want to introduce yourself, Absolutely. please? Absolutely. This is Nilima Parskar. Um, I am president, founder, and CEO for Snap IT Solutions. Um, we are a technology company uh, situated in the United States in Kansas City. Um, we have grown over um, five other states um, in the past year itself. We, the main idea behind Snap IT Solutions is to develop develop our own talent here in the local communities. Tech talent has become a prime um, challenge for many countries. In, of course, the United States is one of them. Um, our model enhances and, uh, and increases the ability to grow um, tech talent here locally through trainings, uh, product development and solutions, and we work with Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies to be able to take their work and grow, get the work done through the talent that we have developed. Developed. We have done that. Um, we have increased our trainings just in last year of about 1,000%. Um, and the rate at which the unemployment has uh, you know, grew uh, due to COVID has uh, astonishing impacts on our society. And the amount of t t technology that we are all using is only going to grow, um, you know, in future. And finding ways to find the talent, um, not just through a conventional method, is now uh, of prime importance than before. So that's where we are facing the challenge. Yeah, amazing introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, ben. Oh, sorry, no, not Ben. Paul. Paul, sorry. <laughs> I'll do uh, it again. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm currently chairman of a company called CloudGates, and we're a, we're a, a compliance cloud company. Uh, I'm also the founder of Rio Advancement, which is a hyper cloud company, and I also have uh, my own investment fund, uh, fund All Star Ventures Company. Amazing. And just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of One Protocol and a social commerce app called Yay, which is mainly used by Gen Z to uh, create content and uh, get rewarded fairly for the content that uh, Gen Z, uh, these young users are creating. Therefore, we are a platform or we are creating technologies that are helping especially younger generations to monetize 
their content creation and are in a way also um, uh, helping to move to a careless society because they are earning a crypto inside our platforms and they are able to cash this out or get rewarded and cash out their rewards in various ways. And so I'm very much uh, looking always into what Gen Z or the younger generations are, um, what kind of tools and technologies they are using. And I think this is very important looking now into um, uh, the internet usage, especially, you know, of younger generations, they were leading the adoption in, in all, in digital media, but also in, in mobile technologies. And the question is to start off, uh, with our topic, um, why are we still so behind? Um, we have overall a very, I mean, globally seen a very young population on this planet, but still uh, 3.7 billion are not having access to all the digital tools needed, all the infrastructure needed to participate in a, in a digital society and therefore later on also in a cashless society. What is your take on where are we lacking? What is it? Okay, so so we go in the same order. I guess um, it seems to, to, to us that the um, biggest reason driving this digital desi- divide is not actually what you call the connectivity gap where people can't physically access the internet. We think that only accounts for about 15% of that unconnected population. Um it, 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 connectivity does remain an issue, but it's actually being method, me, methodically addressed through things like cheaper and more powerful smartphones, cheaper, wider spread and better service from telcos, uh, support from the governments um, of the world seeking the benefits of the internet economy for their people. Um, so there is actually a lot of, uh, of, of progress taking place and, and in fact, infrastructure, we don't believe to be the root. Well, I, um, if I have to uh, address or uh, rethink about the situation, it's a combination of infrastructure and political agenda uh, combined with um, lack of uh, knowledge on what the difference or lock, lack of awareness, I would say, on uh, what the change of their lifestyle would be if the the segment of people that we are talking about are to be connected to the internet and the digital uh, side of it. Um, if the awareness comes, then the demand for infrastructure comes into place. If the, dem- if the infrastructure is in place, then obviously the awareness will follow. So it's almost become a chicken and an egg situation is what I feel like in that sense. Paul. Uh, I, I believe it's uh, cultural more than anything. Uh, I, I think uh, when you're dealing with different cultures, uh, the decentral model won't work in central ruled uh, areas of the world. Um, and you have some areas that uh, just don't have the, the bandwidth of, uh, of somebody actually having the infrastructure set up um, in a trustworthy manner like we have here. Um, so I, I think that's the main uh, hurdle for, for some of the other regions in the world. But in the U.S., it's more of a trust issue more than anything. Um, you know, it's very, it's very difficult to get into, uh, into the coin market, into a, a, a Bitcoin wallet. You know, these, these things are a bit cumbersome. There, there's a newer applications that are making it easier. But it's still a little tricky, and, and the decentralization of it so scares uh, some people away from it. But on the other hand, I mean, we see, especially in the younger generations, they have their mobile phones with them 24-7. And also, um, we have seen um, like a continent like Africa, how they were jumping kind of over uh, the the traditional landline uh, telephone uh, networks and immediately jumping into the mobile networks. So um, is it kind of infrastructure, uh, cultural background, but maybe it's also, uh, like you said, in Lima, uh, education, right? How can we tackle this educational problem? Yeah, I think, um, as you mentioned, um, right in the beginning, the Gen Zs of the world um, are definitely a lot more aware about 
the planet, human lifestyle of what it means to live, um, you know, in, in, a, in a phase where you don't really necessarily work to make money, but you're working to make a better living. Um, and what does that really mean? So they have a different attitude and aptitude towards um, this approach. And I'm very hopeful that the Gen Zs will definitely bring an impact. But here's the challenge, though. If we need to change the infrastructure, we are depending on, you know, to tell you the truth, we're depending on financial institutes supporting it. And why would they support uh, a decentralized <laughs> economy when they are the ones that would be impacted? So, you know, are we not? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like an oxymoron situation at this point. That's right. true. That's true. Uh, but um, the question is still for these uh, centralized institutions. Um, uh, these new decentralized technologies uh, can't be reverse engineered. <laughs> the cat is out of the bag, right? Yes, and yeah. uh, it is uh, driven it's by, there. yeah, it's it's all there, right? And I think uh, really what, what makes me hopeful is seeing uh, the part of adoption that is already happening in in a continent like Africa, where um, they, they are just having access through their mobile phones and they are um, trying to get into any kind of DeFi product. I mean, we have seen Nigeria being uh, one of the most traded pairs on, on Binance um, because uh, it's already happening. It's this this cat is out of out of the bag, right? Um, so I know that um, I need to read this uh, because it's it's a reference. The UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed said the task of achieving universal connectivity cannot be left slowly solely to governments or even to individual technology companies. Um, what's your take on? Do you agree um, with this, or um, how can national and local governments or the private sector? Uh, civil society, academia, and multilateral organizations all play their collective uh, part in that. Maybe, Ben, you start with it again. Sure, yeah. I think um, if we go back to um, thinking about September 25 in 2015 when the United Nations um, launched its Sustainable Development Goals, uh, as as you may recall, that's when um, Target 9C was introduced, which was significantly increase access of information and communication technology to strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in the least developed countries by 2020. So obviously, it's a big fail. That 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 absolutely has not happened. And, and But at the time, when that was announced, uh, Mark Zuckerberg actually gave the keynote address at the United Nations. The, the, the New York Times published an op-ed by him and Bono about uh, how Internet access was essential for achieving humanity's goals. And then, uh, for those who remember it, Beyonce gave a concert in Central Park. So it was a, a big deal of trying to bring together uh, um, civil society business and and government and if we think what happened since 2015 it seems obviously a number of things have gone wrong particularly around this area that 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 you guys have talked about of trust so, so that kind of utopian rhetoric of like the internet's going to save everybody uh, uh, in 2015 se seemed very meaningful but what's happened since then is obviously Big internet companies have suffered from many problems, to, like fake news and propaganda and surveillance and and, and 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 issues with privacy. And I think governments of almost every type have become suspicious of the internet and the companies behind it that run run it. No matter what type, you know, the most repressive to the most progressive. <laughs> Governments all feel like that the internet is providing platforms for 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 um, people that that are trying to do harm, and um, and I think as a result, as we've seen all over the world, the CEOs of big tech companies kind of dragged in front of 
like McCarthyist type of uh, uh, um, interrogations about about their platforms, and um, and so obviously I think that 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 collaboration that seems so promising between government and 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 internet companies is sort of, is fallen down, and and I'm sure that exactly like the crypto community is has also suffered from this kind of suspicion and and, and so on. But so I think one starting point is that people have to acknowledge it's like the philosopher Paul Virilio said, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. Mm -hmm. And basically every technology not only brings the good, but it also has its own issues, its own problems. So today we all accept that cars are a safe form of of transportation and the internet is too, but it doesn't yet have the equivalence of driver education, of the rules of the road, of safety belts, of airbags, of emission controls, all of these kind of regulations that allow uh, 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 vehicles to be safe. And so I, I definitely think that these kind of corporations and governments and civil society need to take a more collaborative and less combative approach to uh, regulation as well as investment and and honestly adopt a more diplomatic type of language to say we have this common goal to empower all of these people to overcome all the reasons that people can't use the internet which is poverty which is lack of language uh, which is lack of literacy which is the languages they speak not being present on the internet um, and, and the content they want not being present on the internet and 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 I think if um, if if we're much more honest and diplomatic about saying we have to we have to address all these things together, no government can do it by themselves. No company can do it by themselves, uh, and no community can do it by themselves. I th- I think that that's probably the framework we need to address these problems with. Yeah. I- I'm so sorry. I think I got, um, I don't know, locked out of the system. Um, Paul, have you already <laughs> answered also? Or if, no, 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 no I, 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 was, I was hogging the stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Great, great. Um, well, I mean, also when we are talking about um, how to accelerate digital inclusion, um, the major part not yet or isn't part of this digital inclusion are are women. Um, How can we tackle this huge issue? Because if women would be included, uh, it is known there are many, um, there's a lot of research out there, many statistics, how much um, the GDP would rise with this, um, with women being included in it. What's how how to tackle this big issue on top of all the others that we have? Nadima, do you want to start? Absolutely. So, um, uh, as uh, you mentioned, about 600 million women are still not connected uh, to digital um, literacy or transformation, transforming their lives to the next. Uh, 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 most of us have been enjoying it for at least two decades, if not more. Mm-hmm. So how do we tackle this? Obviously, there it's a multifaceted answer, but um, one of the top things that I can I can go back and rely on is um, awareness and education again, because that education de- transforms people into understanding and overcoming any cultural inhibitions about women going out and having their own. Um, you know, bank account for for very simple states, right? For they um, n- not feeling like they should be having a bank account. It's a it's a it's not a woman's you know probably a uh, you know place to be or not having the influence of making a decision whether it is family based, community based, cities, country, state. There's a lot more leadership missing uh, for women representation as well. And also men who are supporting in not just women by but human, um, you know, uh, uniform uh, representation of human presence and having a voice from different areas. 
So I think it's a combination again to solve this problem with um, education and awareness um, and combating this as a unified stance. Now, it's not just to be doing good for this particular segment. It's also doing good for the entire population. As um, you mentioned, um, about 18 billion euro, there'll be increase of GDP of 18 billion euros. If 600 million women are connected, imagine the amount of financial um, and stability that all the countries will be facing if that particular education or uh, issue is being tackled that way. Now, reflecting on one of the issues that we recently um, faced is women leadership. Even about a decade back, women in entrepreneurship, women in leadership was significantly lower in numbers, even in single digits. So that was um, talked about, addressed, made aware, educated. And we've seen a lot more changes, a lot more major corporations and big corporations are taking women leaders as their CEOs and C-level exec positions. That is changing the front. So if we do need uh, and dare to think about big and bold moons, uh, we definitely have to rely on starting with education and awareness and bringing in the right parties in. Absolutely. And we have seen now also a lot of um, IPOs um, led by female CEOs, which is exciting from Vimeo to Bumble. Um, Paul. Yeah, what's your take on how to tackle this issue? Uh, I think it's more of an innovative collaboration that needs to be done with world leaders. Um, the, the world is so different in different areas. You can't apply the same standards of the West to the East. Um, Absolutely. So you're going to have to have proper dialogue, uh, respecting the cultures and the kingdoms and you know, whatever uh, organizations run those countries. And w through uh, minor changes, you can have large influence. Uh, if you go in there trying to dictate uh, how somebody's uh, culture should be uh, changed, I think you're going to have an adverse reaction to it. Yeah. Ben, your take? Uh, well, I think that there, there's a... Um, it's, it's obviously a, 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 a noble and great ambition to... to um, bring more uh, uh, internet access to, to women. Um, but I, I guess uh, there are more fundamental social issues related to why these women can't access the internet that aren't so much to do with technology. Firstly, poverty. Um, now, extreme poverty has diminished every single year for the last 25 years until last year when it increased by 150 million more people fell into into extreme poverty. Um, so what, th what that means is that maybe a family can afford a phone among those groups, possibly, but they can't afford the data. And so it, uh, um, it, it, it's a much greater issue than, than just uh, internet access. Similarly, illiteracy. 800 million people that cannot read um, and 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 I actually we believe there's probably more I mean recent reports said mm. that 20 percent of, uh, of, of adults in the USA are functionally illiterate um, and that obviously excludes them from internet use linguistic exclusion is also really important there's 7,000 languages in the world about 300 of which are used on the internet. Um, so obviously if there's no content in the language you speak, the internet isn't very useful to you. Now obviously that's somewhat addressed by user-generated content, um, but, that, but there's a kind of network effect there that until there are more people that speak your language using the internet and actually posting content, it's it's uh, um, there's nothing there for you, and, that, and and I guess that's the other thing is just lack of re relevant content functionality. Our company is very much about providing functionality too, because uh, um, it's one thing 
to introduce internet access as a consumer experience. But really what we would like to see is introducing the tools to actually create content on the internet, to actually transact on the internet, to, to, to do business on the internet, um, to create your own content relevant to your community on the internet. And these are quite different tools from you know, watching Netflix or, um, or searching or posting to Facebook even. Um, then lastly, there is the whole concerns about safety that I think we've all talked about and, 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 and lack of trust. And we know that in some instances that's well-founded uh, um, and, and, and that um, it isn't just simply a, a matter of saying, hey, yeah, they've got to get with the 21st century and start using technology. There, there, there's things that technology companies can do, think along the lines of what Paul's saying, to be more sensitive to different communities, different value standards and so on, to make sure that their experience of the internet is something that is, is, is relevant to them and safe for them. Absolutely. I think we all agree. I mean, there are just um, a lot of gains in connecting the unconnected, uh, no matter male, female, or wherever they are coming from. However, um, talking also about the cashless society, which is also part of our topic here, um, there are probably uh, pros and cons to it. And uh, I would love to start <laughs> with the positive sides, with the advantages of a cashless society um, and, and hear your thoughts around um, where you see them. Maybe, um, Paul, do you want to share your views on that? Sure. Um, as far as cashless society, I don't think there's any uh, advantage to that. Uh, a paperless society, yes, there, there is a uh, <laughs> advantage to that. You should always have the ability to do uh, transactions in private, right? Um, so I think that no matter where you are in the world, you can invest in a, a blockchain such as Ethereum, uh, a Bitcoin, uh, which are now stored values more than anything. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to create wealth or lose wealth. You know, it depends on when you invest. But I think that the opportunity really doesn't come often uh, with any other form of uh, transaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Lima, uh, what's your take on cashless? I mean, it's clearly cashless is, I, I guess, <laughs> meant really paperless. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's yeah. the wording, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it'll increase the trust in mm -hmm. in um, in general uh, the valuation of a product rather than us depending on some banks or countries minting their cash paper <laughs> and uh, saying okay this is we have money but we probably don't have money the valuation is not as correct so now decentralizing. The, the concept a concept of what um, what a particular dollar value is or particular rupee value is or you know yen but no matter what you take it's now the population people are deciding how much do I spend on that for example take diamonds market right there's a lot of that would change if people start valuating a diamond differently. Right. It's as common in some countries as rocks. So um, there is monopolized uh, market uh, and we are all playing around with that particular one organization dictating what diamond value is. Right. So those are advantages. But the advantages are more towards people who are not having power positions at this point. Right. And that's where we go back to the Gen Z's asking for it. Mm -hmm. who don't have power, who have who has a voice and who has cell phones in their hand <laughs> and who have the power to say, I want this, right? So that, that's where we are observing these. Now, whether it becomes, uh, sometimes it's good for some people, the same thing is bad for some other people, right? Who are we talking about is where we'll decide if it's good or bad. Um, so, yes. Overall, if I'm looking at it uh, to uh, not only decentralizing and properly valuating a product, um, you know, that's what we are going towards. 
but also how do we bring in re less uh, reason to um, you know uh, uh, paperless kind of thing, right? You know, we are saving some trees, but not creating cash in that sense, creating uh, you know the, the money uh, transactions and making it digital. But then look at it. Digital footprint also requires physical footprint. Cloud doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does exist. It does exist in a server somewhere. It is a footprint. So if we overdo that, we will overdo footprint about storing our location as well. We need to think so much more future before we jump into trying to solve a problem for the wrong reasons. Hmm. Very good point. Very good point. Um, ben, how do you... I was going to say, no, no, you I you've just been to this Bitcoin event in Miami. I think you're probably the person who's got all the latest information. It'd be really interesting to, 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 to hear your thoughts on this subject. Well, I mean, I was deeply impressed how many people were attending Uh, which clearly has shown to me that this is um, now truly finding its step-by-step -step adoption. Um, it were around 22,000 people attending at this yeah. conference. And it really felt, oh, yeah, we, we are here um, in the... Maybe it's just the beginning of a movement because whatever, I mean, Bitcoin inspired all of us, you know, in what kind of other decentralized technologies and, and use cases uh, could be out there. Um, and, um, yeah, seeing all the people being um, that more and more people got into it now. And it was really so inspiring because it was all ethnicities. It was ages, you know, from old to young people. Um, it was a celebration of um, freedom and inclusion in so many ways. So um, definitely an amazing event. And uh, as Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he or she or the group was, has built a masterpiece of technology, but um, probably wasn't the best marketeer on earth. And, and now after 12 years, after all these years seeing, oh, Uh, without even a marketing force, the technology itself, the network has grown to such an extent. And um, it's it's true word of mouth that happened over all these years. And, and here we are. And it's just going uh, to the next level, I think. But coming also to the, um, you know, to the disadvantages, I mean, what what is also uh, thinking about cash, less society, paperless society, Uh, now that we have uh, Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies and all the infrastructure already out there, obviously, you know, regulators are looking more and more into this space. And obviously, also central banks are thinking, how can we get a stake in that? And so a question is, you know, where are the disadvantages? What's with the digital yuan? What's with uh, the digital euro, digital US dollar? Um, um, how is this going to be used for the good? but maybe also for the bad. Um, so what are the disadvantages um, that you can see? Mm. Who wants to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's really my area of expertise. It's, uh, I'll maybe leave it to the others. <laughs> um, I don't know um, if, if I'm an expert in that. Sorry, Paul. No, no, go ahead. Wait. I, I don't know if I'm an expert in it, but it's it's definitely a food for thought is I just want to, I think from observing a lot more um, enthusiasm from people, like you said, Melania, um, you know, having 22,000 people uh, attend a conference during COVID, it's a big deal. It's, it's, uh, it's not a... It's definitely a need and a want and definitely a new toy in the industry, new excitement, something that we all are envisioning that anybody, um, you know, who would like to go um, into this mode of decentralized power, right? That's what I think is more uh, the reason for creating a cashless, cashless society. It's the, probably the driving force 
is we have been under influence uh you know from a single digit uh, percentage of people the entire world is living on those terms how about we don't do that how about we go towards the other side is what i think we are all looking towards um whether it is the disadvantage of that part could be we may be creating something that we are not ready for it yet uh some people may not have the access like you we all know they're not connected and the more and more we push towards decent um, the digital currency the more and more we are leaving some people behind or sometimes we will force them and the com- community and the government to uh, uh formulate that infrastructure uh, so i i'd like to uh, just emphasize on that i, I believe the uh, digital currencies were actually created for those who were left behind um so i don't think it's uh, but if they don't have uh, access to internet yeah so so there's very few populations left in the world that really have uh, no internet um past war torn areas and uh, some indigenous regions but like a like, the way bitcoin has uh, created an economic wave that anybody in the world can invest uh, at their own basically investment banker um has kind of created an equilibrium for uh, for central banks so on the on the other side of that the the wrong side is that sometimes you do see uh people that are hacking uh companies going after uh bitcoin as a user Uh, as a method of payment, and uh, to their to their knowledge, they they think they're going to get away with it. But Bitcoin is the most tracked uh, thing on the planet, so usually they know where the money goes. But uh, you know, with everything, you, you can do right or wrong. But uh, there's more right than there is wrong on the the blockchain uh, currencies. But you know, it's just a matter of we we could get into one. You know. I keep plug here at at some at some point next year I'll launch a cryptocurrency myself but I believe the the smarter approach would be a central bank um version of one I I don't think a, a decentral version uh is necessary anymore as the uh, what we already have with the uh, likes of Ethereum and 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 Bitcoin itself Sure but is there any potential for surveillance societies Oh yeah. You have one regardless just because of the nature of the internet um it's a public forum. So uh, until we get into uh what I in terms like hypercloud and and uh, people have an understanding of what's public what's private um you you're going to always have that surveillance uh part of it no matter what and that that's what Bitcoin was originally created for to uh you know throw off that surveillance as much as possible but now it's uh it's pretty well tracked I think. We were just I actually think about, oh. I'm sorry we were just okay. talking Paul before you came in I said uh, we were just talking about startup um on Netflix it's an interesting um series that's going on bitcoin and the yeah, digital currency Besides the infrastructure I I truly believe that it's um going to be a battle for um the best UI UX um who is designing uh, kind of a cashless uh, society or all the tools uh, with it and the infrastructure used in a way that people will have this ease and convenience to adopt it and therefore i truly think that uh, the digital uh, digital currencies of of central banks will find their way to adoption they will make it very easy to transact uh, in some way or the other However, uh I believe that people will slowly get smarter in what kind of currencies to use for what. So, you know, if you're going into the um in into your grocery store, you might use, you know, your digital euro or whatever because you don't care this is the money you pay, you know, you have after taxes and and uh you don't care if someone knows exactly, you know, that you're buying maybe a milk or whatever. Um uh in in the grocery store, but there will be some forms where you say, "No, I already did, you know, whatever I could do to contribute to society paying my taxes." this is now my private thing what i can do and i will use a privacy coin for whatever you know where where people should not judge what i'm doing with my money and um 
Similar to that, then you will transition out of all the little gigs where you are earning these utility tokens, yeah, um, where you make a second, you know, income or something. You might use them in in a different network or transition them into Bitcoin as store of value. So I think we will slowly get into this where to use which kind of which format of of a of a digital uh, asset or a digital currency and be get smarter in when to use what. But I'm still thinking that infrastructure, because we think everyone is connected to the internet, but 3.7 billion aren't. And therefore, um, that's uh, probably an, a huge uh, hurdle still to overcome in, in the decades to come. Um, I think we are slowly getting to already to the end of our session. There are still some, some uh, questions left, um, but maybe um, there is uh, no more time for that. Um, maybe you can give a kind of an end statement about um, what you are currently excited about. Are there any kind of technologies or, or even, you know, educational websites or something that you came across that will either help um, for digital inclusion or um, helping us all moving into a paperless uh, society. I'm always keen to hear what are the tools or the projects or the stuff or founders you have just recently learned about and are excited about. Besides yourself. <laughs> and the work you're doing. <laughs> the passion that you're giving. Yeah. Uh, sure. Well, I, I, I guess... Um I'm always, uh, I, I, I think maybe I, at, at risk of repeating myself, for me, the, the real excitement comes from not just giving people access to the internet, but giving them the tools to actually not just uh, um, use Facebook and Netflix and so on, but build the Facebooks and Netflix of the future from parts of the world where, uh, where we never would have imagined it. And so um, uh, I'm sure there's there's millions of, of projects and people learning to code in high school and so on around the world that 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 you know uh, that that are the vehicles of the hope for, for for our futures. And I think not only distributed currencies, but the internet being fully distributed in terms of content and creation and 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 transactions is what excites me. Wonderful, Nilima. Um, the, the the complete breaking of the divide, digital divide. Um, no matter whether you're talking about digital currency, education, uh, transformation of, uh, you know, and bringing the equality in multiple, um, you know, communities. That excites me quite a bit, and I think. For the first time, out of all the bad uh, situations COVID has brought us in, the one silver lining this situation has brought us all in is one shot. Everybody's attention is is on the same thing. And we all are actually more empathetic because we have lived it through that experience. So for the first time, people have been empathetic towards each other, not just sympathetic. So, you know, let's take advantage of the situation. And, you know, it's like I believe Ben said, it's not just about, you know, doing good for others. It's actually doing good for humanity. If we don't be good to our planet and ourselves, there won't be humanity in future. So let's get that awakening up. Wonderful. Paul, you're last but not least. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, one of the cool tools that people could use uh, is Telegram. It's uh, it's very popular, uh, especially within the crypto community, and uh, it's a decentralized chat. So uh, I think uh, that's one of the, the more popular things that people can use for privacy. But uh, we're all excited with where crypto is going, where the blockchain has taken people with supply chain, and uh, maybe it'll be st maybe we can start using it to uh, solve some of the the COVID. Uh, Areas that are that are becoming populated uh, with the sickness, so that that could be a, a certain use case that we could look out for in the future. Amazing. 
we unfortunately now came to an end for our session. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Horaces, again, for um, delivering us this platform for these open discussions and sharing our perspective and views. And um, I really hope to see that we are all participating in accelerating digital inclusion for so many more, for 3.7 billion people in this world. Thank you so much for attending and participating. Right. Goodbye. Thank you, Lonnie. Thanks, everybody. Great questions. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.